Well, I think it's clear that we've started this episode about mistakes off with a mistake. I'm going to go ahead and accept the invitation for the podcast. Okay. Looks like we're a little behind. Um, Yes. But I do hear the music playing us in. Okay. So, well, at least we're getting started then. Yes, I think I think that's just Anthony passive aggressively, like, all right, guys, let's do this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as our podcast audience knows, it's only been about 15 seconds, but for our Instagram live audience, it's, it's been, been about, about 10, 15, 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's why you should check out the Instagram live just to see what happens before we actually start yeah. rolling. But without further ado, welcome to the Video Reformation Podcast. I am Ben Oliver. I'm Justin Plant. We are the co-founders of Storyboard Media and your guides to practicing effective video for business. We're like the Rufus to your Bill and Ted on your excellent adventure. Uh, before we jump into our topic today, which is, as mentioned, mistakes we've made. Uh, a little it'll, be a short, it'll be a short podcast. It'll be a, yeah. I, you, it, it's probably not even mistakes we've made. Probably more like lessons we've learned. Well, because we don't make a yeah, I um, literally have that line written down like two paragraphs from now. Oh, do you? Yeah. So I'm glad we're on the same page with that. I'm I'm on the same page now. Little housekeeping, uh, as usual, we would like to hear from you what you'd like to hear us discussing. This episode is actually kind of a combination of some feedback, not necessarily a direct request, but some feedback that we've gotten on uh, our evolution of storyboard media. Uh, episode, uh, as well as um, just some questions that we've, we've gotten recently. So uh, we do feel like this is valid. So this comes from hearing from our listeners and viewers. So, uh, you know, keep them coming. And uh, we've already discussed several of the requests that we've gotten and figuring out how to do those episodes. So, um, yeah, keep it coming. We also have a new sponsor. Mm-hmm. This episode, yes, we do. Very do we have that the- copy yet, or, mm-hmm. or do we yep. have the company name? I guess we don't need the copy until later. <laughs> Not yet. We did. <laughs> no, uh, Tuxy. Tuxy. Yep. How do you spell that? T U X Y. T U X Y. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I look. Forward are we, to are we supposed to do the tagline there too, or is it just the the client name, and we'll just get to it later? You know, I think um, I think voiceover artist choice. Okay. So if, if you want to... It's kind of a... It kind of... If you want to wet the whistle... It's almost the ad. Then I'd hold so, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold. Yeah. And, and instead of listening to us, people can just think about what Tuxie might be. I'm already Do you going have any a, guesses? I'm already going a tushy direction with it. Mm. Um, but I've just got tushy on the mind, so <laughs> maybe that's why. Um, all right, so stick around... Uh, in the show and we'll hear the full spot uh, a bit later on from Tuxie. Um, let me read the next line. Okay, on to today's topic. <laughs> mistakes we've made. I imagine this episode isn't as much about the mistakes we've made, but what we learned from them. Wow. Genius. It's like opening up an envelope that was like dated and sealed. And I was like, that, I, that was my prediction of what you were going to say. Okay. Yes. Because of course, as everyone knows, we don't make any mistakes. So you yeah, can't that, really. That's be an why I episode. got stuck for so long. Yeah, we Come meant on. to do this like episode six, but it's now episode thirty-two, and we finally <laughs> realized how to rationalize. Yeah, mistakes we yeah, made. Yeah, yeah. It's but you know, things we've <clears throat> learned because of what other people have fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so I, I think, but I think, I think that's a lot of the feedback we got from the evolution of storyboard episode was especially from people who are kind of in this industry with us, whether they're freelancers of ours, people we've worked with before, people who are doing kind of similar things to what we are, you know, we got a lot of response from them that that we've had a lot of the same issues and problems that they're mm-hmm. having. And we're seeing a lot of the same trends that they're seeing. And so I think there's some <clears throat> validation for some of them in that. And uh, I think this is going to be one of those episodes too. I have a very broad list from some project specific instances Mm -hmm. that I think we have takeaways from. I have some business issues that we got. I mean, I think about our contract now and our contract now is so much of just like where we got burned or hosed or didn't plan properly for certain things. And and now our contract like accounts for those. Yeah. For the most part, our contracts are also like, fuck it. Just let's just do this. Yeah. It's it's like, what do you need? It's a page and a half and it says, hello. Yes, it does start with hello. Um, and then I, and then I've got a list of things that are kind of like 
you know, decisions we made mm-hmm. that ultimately proved out to not be the right decisions, mm-hmm. you know, on our business, things like that. So I don't know how many we'll get to. Um, maybe the sense of being a two part episode. Overlap. I don't know. I imagine there's got to be some overlap. I also think it, it's interesting too because I came at this from a slightly different perspective than I originally thought I would. We were on set last week, and one of our clients, Jeff, he manages a, a venture firm or a venture fund. Fund, that's the word. Um, and you know, while we were up in Video Village during one of the set breakdowns, um, he said one of the questions I asked people that we talked to is, "What would you do differently if you started this business today?" Which to me is, you know, what have you learned that, Mm -hmm. you know, you didn't know when you started? And at the time, I told him, you know, from a business standpoint, I probably would have started using more freelancers earlier. Yeah. Um, I think there was, uh, and that's not necessarily one that's on my list. That's just what I told him Mm -hmm. in the moment. But, you know, with how much we rely on uh, our team of freelancers on set, post-production, things like that now... I wish we had the the confidence at that time to have done that earlier, yeah. but at the same time, you can manage things a lot better when you've done it yourself. Well, it was also about hoarding the little cash that came in. Definitely. <laughs> that was a big part of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, so, yeah, who wants to go first? I'll go first. Okay. Um, that one's kind of intense. Let's go. This is a, a kind of a nice light one. We're, uh, are we gonna, we're going to... Try our hardest not to mention company names mm-hmm. in some of these, right? And Anthony will bleep them out or something okay. if he accidentally. But yeah, I don't want to mention them. Um, internship program. Oh, that's a good one, and I did not have that. We have had a number of interns. Yeah. Um, some were, um, like, I don't regret having them. I regret not having a program. <laughs> Right. It took us a couple of years to develop one, and I think that it was a really cool program, but we gave it to the wrong person. <laughs> well, uh, maybe. I tend to look at it, again, I hadn't thought of it, so I'm, I'm just, I'm probably forgetting a lot, but um, we, when we first were offered an intern, we basically had an intern like presented to us. Mm-hmm. Here, hire my daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that time, we just needed a, another set of eyes and another set of hands. And so, like a lot of young companies, we were looking at it as like free labor. Free labor, yeah. exactly. And that's not what an intern is. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think what we realized by continuing to have interns is that it is two things. One, it takes more time to manage your interns than the time the work that they might be doing for you saves you. Mm -hmm. And two, the more structured your program is for them, giving them something to do so that they can learn and and utilize your expertise and resources and Mm -hmm. and whatever, um, is helps them manage themselves. Mm -hmm. And for a small company like ours at the time, I think we were headed the right direction with it. Um, it was a good program where we ended up. So where we ended up was, uh, we would, you know, when we find our intern, we would then, we would use them, basically uh, use them on set for us for like, is a production assistant, or they might help with some editing for a project or setting up a hard drive or whatever it is. Um, but we also gave them their project, their own project. And they had to write up a pitch for what they're, what video they're going to make. Treat us as the client, yep. pitch us, yep. And so they would pitch us, they would shoot, edit, write, we all give, of it. We would give them a budget, we would give them yeah. access to our gear. We gave them like yep. 1500 bucks or something to, if they needed a, yeah, if they need to rent or license a song or whatever it is. Or a helicopter or whatever <laughs> it is they might have wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and then they had that summer or semester to to make their video project, and so that was a good, that was a good, uh, little bundle of, of like here's how you can, here's how you can learn from us and, and learn with us. We ended up going with some with somebody who wanted to do more like short story kind of video. And it wasn't really aligned with our B2B commercial type 
video projects. And so it, we just never really meshed and didn't have the right like understanding of what this was about. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of the interns we've had were awesome people. Remember Nani? She was amazing, like yeah. a hard, hard, hard worker. Um, well, and and let let's let's also point out for anybody who's trying to get hired anywhere too, she stuck out to us because she said she was one of our one of I think the only applicant who said I don't really want to do on set stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm more interested in like the pre production stuff and kind of the like producing, distribution yeah. producing like just the the behind the scenes, not on set stuff, mm-hmm. which was a very welcome um, uh, change. A change yeah. for for what we've been getting, um, and yeah, and I, I think like anything else, you you tend to overcompensate based on who your last, mm-hmm. you know, what your last experience was, whether it's with a client or an intern or an employee or something like that. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I think you have to have aligned goals. Certainly, because so often they came to us because we were looked at as a production company. Yeah, and we were just that for se- several years, and it, but. We even as a production company, we spend so little time on set compared to the amount of work we do in an office. Yeah. So it was just a. I think for a lot of those production focused interns too, it was like, wait, we're only going to be shooting two or three times this summer. Right. I think mean, there's a lot to learn in building up to a shoot, but that's not what they <laughs> they signed up for. Yeah. I think I think one of the one of the early things that we learned was to clearly define the beginning and the end of an internship. With our first intern, we um, we kind of, it was just kind of an open-ended thing. And there was a lot of, uh, we hired her uh, at the end of her senior year in high school, <clears throat> through the summer between high school and college, and had plans to continue with her as our intern. And once she got to college, as a freshman, like as a freshman, yeah. like it just, we should have seen it coming, um, but I think we quickly learned that we needed to have semester internships, mm-hmm. you know, spring, fall, a, a and summer, end. just a clear. Here's when we start. Here's when this thing ends, and I think that's what led us to. And here's the project mm-hmm. that you have. So this is why we have this structure for you. I think another big thing that we learned, and this is something that employers and interns need to understand, is that. The way that the language um, works for um, you know the government, part of an internship is, um, in fact, that there is no guaranteed job available. A lot of people have this misconception on both ends that an internship is like a trial for a mm-hmm. job that's available. And it's very clearly written out in the internship guidelines that there can't be the guarantee of a job. If there's a guarantee of a job, then you just have to hire them. For that job, sure. At that time, um, and I think that's something that we ran into with one of our interns, also, where uh, where there was um, on on his end um, an assumption that there was a guarantee of of a full time job uh, after the internship. He was very upset when there was not a job, <laughs> but there just wasn't a job, yeah. right? It wasn't it wasn't even that, that, we, that we you know that we chose not to hire him. There just wasn't anything that we had available for him. Yeah. Um, and that's something that I wish we had communicated better. And, um, you know, largely our reaction to it since has been to stop an internship program. But it is because it, of the tremendous resources that it takes to manage effectively yeah. to do right and to not be, you know, to not cause a whole, you know, minefield of problems for both the intern and yourself as a company going on. So it's it's hard to do. I'm glad we did it. I'm glad we failed at it. Because should we ever do it again, I think we're going to do it a lot better than, you know, and when we're ready to be mm-hmm. able to commit to it. I haven't thought about having interns yeah. in probably two years. Yeah. So I think that's a really interesting one. You're up. I'm up. Um, all right. I will go with, I think people want to hear the client-specific projects that screwed up, but I'm going to stay away from those up front here. Um, I, cause this is something we've done multiple times. Um, and this apply the Parkinson's law applies to this Parkinson's laws that work expands as to fill the time available for its completion. Mm-hmm. And, and this works on two levels. One, it's like you set a due date 
of when a first cut or a final cut is going to be delivered. Mm -hmm. And, like, it ends up getting delivered on that day, even if it could have been ready two weeks earlier. Yeah, yeah. But for me, it's more in the bigger projects that we had where there was no uh, urgency on the client side, no specific release date or anything. That, that we have one of those, those going on right now, by the way. We have yes, that we have more than one of those going on right now, <clears> by the way. That that without, I mean, if, if you believe that work expands us to fill the time available for its completion, and the time is unlimited, then the work becomes unlimited. Mm -hmm. And so there are so many times <clears> where, <throat> when you have to make, when you have to prioritize certain tasks within your team, and oh, the client isn't sitting there waiting for it, mm -hmm. is the first thing that comes to mind when you then push that item down the prioritization yeah. Like, list. oh, they're not in a rush. And it's, it's just so easy. And that's what's so, like, it's almost evil. That's what's so, like, tricky about it is it's so easy to just push that stuff. Mm -hmm. It causes a whole lot of problems. I would probably file this under a mistake that we've made over and over and over again. <laughs> no is a problem, but, and we've learned from it, but we haven't figured out how to fix it yet. Yeah. Right. So at least we recognize the problem, but um, it it ends up taking. I mean, it can have a whole wide range of 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 effects. It can affect budget. If you've got if you've got freelancers that you're paying for and you're you're you want to do five rounds of internal revisions because mm -hmm. the client isn't expecting anything. Well, that 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 freelance editor or animator is still going to be charging you for their time. Mm -hmm. If you've got a big project that seems overwhelming and complicated and has many moving parts all at once, uh, it's really easy to just say, I'll get to that tomorrow. And then I'll get to that tomorrow. Because I mean, I, we've had multiple projects where like three weeks disappear and it feels like nothing has happened. And yet we've been working on it to some extent every day, but not necessarily making any progress. Yeah. It's so frustrating, but it's so easy to, it's so easy to rationalize because there's stuff that, that is time sensitive that, that it's just too easy. It, it, it's just one of those, it's just one of those things that, that we keep falling into. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and I, I don't know. So should I go next? Yeah, unless you had anything else on, on that. Well, for me, uh, one of the biggest mistakes we made um, was not that we fired a client, but it's how we went about firing them. Okay. And the reason I bring this one up now is because that was the, that that unlimited time. Yeah. You know, we had a eight month project, let's call it, with twenty eight deliverables or something. Yeah. If we are expecting to make a hundred grand in those eight months, but we end up working twelve months, but still only have a hundred grand, we're losing money. Our profitability is sinking every day that we. Yeah. And so, when uh, when a client isn't responsive or, or quickly um, making decisions or whatever, that just stretches out our timelines. We got to a point where we had to let the client go with un with with things that were not delivered yeah. according to the contract. But we were several months behind because we couldn't get decisions made. I don't regret firing the client. I regret how we did it, which was basically cutting all ties quick, like very quickly. I thought it was going to be the best way to do it, like cauterize. Mm -hmm. And um, there could have been some more conversations, I think, yeah, to, to make it a little bit more clear that, that this is what's going to happen right. if we don't make changes. I, I, and and I, I think it's, it's say, without going into too much detail, the timeline was something that we brought up many times. Yeah, yep. But, but you're absolutely right. We didn't say, here's what's going to happen if this isn't solved. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, <clears throat> and, and I think that's, and, and I think maybe one of the, maybe what this does is it just opens the door to the entire mistake of, of not leading the client. Because I've got, I mean, I, I've got at least one example on here where because we had a good relationship with the client, we let scope creep happen, too many revisions, largely because the client didn't know what they wanted. The, the response was, it's not there. Well, what do you want? I don't know, but I'll know it when I see it. Mm -hmm. And similar to the no definite deadline, 
um, when you when you trust a client like that and have a good working relationship, you want them to be wowed, right? You mm-hmm. want them to feel what it is they're trying to feel. And uh, and in that particular situation, we gave up. We gave up and let them lead us, and we just kept throwing things at them. Mm-hmm. Is this it? Is this is this it? Partially because because they couldn't tell us what they wanted. Mm-hmm. And so we kept trying things, and then that just soured the project and the relationship. Mm-hmm. And, and this is a different one. This is someone who, who, we, who we ultimately didn't end up firing, but had to take a break from mm-hmm. for a while. Um, and but I it think, was the same with the client we fired, too. It was yes. the same, yeah. Yeah, and, and so, and so you, you, have to, you have to balance the uh, making the client happy with getting the project done. Mm-hmm. I don't even remember where the line came from, so I think we've just attributed it to me um, at this point. But but a video is never finished; it's just taken away. Mm-hmm. And you have to, in our position, you have to remember that it's your job to say, "This is this, this is, is it. this is it. Mm-hmm. This is what we agreed to. This meets everything." That, and I think that's something that we learned from from the the follow-up to the client that we did fire is that we had a version that was perfectly usable. Yeah. Right. And they could have chosen to use that version. Mm-hmm. And, and, but we didn't even really see it that way while it was going on. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until looking back in kind of a post-mortem. Like, Oh, these are all 95% finished. Exactly. Exactly. Or like, you know, <clears throat> here's here, th- this way isn't working. We know this. Um, because we're not happy with where it is, you're not happy with where it is. So let's try this. Mm-hmm. And when you look at at what it was, it completely satisfied everything. But but it was it was just immediately dismissed. Mm-hmm. So it's it's on the producer to say to know when to say this is what we're delivering you, so that at least they get something yep. in a worst case scenario. Yeah, you've got to you've got to make like some projects. Sure, maybe you have all the flexibility in the world and you can keep funding it so that you can keep doing sure. different things. But if video is a practice, then more than likely you're going to have to replace this video in a year or two with a, with a new updated version. Yep. And so it's, it's about like get it out, understand its, its value or its power to your, to your audience, and then adjust that moving forward. But you can't get any of that information if you don't post it. Right. So this is more soul searching than I thought it would be. Who uh, who just went? You? I think I think I went. Oh, and then I, I you followed it up, partly. and I added one of mine that was kind of on the same. <laughs> okay. So I think we're back on you. <clears throat> okay. I've only got four here. I've got like a dozen. So why don't you go again? Okay. Um. Let me shift gears a little bit and and talk about two projects with the same parent company, but different subsidiaries, because I think they were different. So, uh, real estate world, Mm -hmm. two properties owned by the same company. Yeah. And we've done multiple projects for for this company, but there were two of them particularly. One was probably our fourth project ever as a company. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one was the, the second project for one of the properties that was like our first project ever. Wait, okay, I think I'm confused. <laughs> I know. I'm, so, yeah, that's a bleep. <laughs> and then, ah, 360, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, the first one yeah. um, was when we started talking about mistakes we've made, the first thing that popped into my mind. The first, and it's the first project on my list, even when I started writing them down after thinking about them for a while. And what I will never forget about that one is we had reached a level of confidence in our creative abilities and technical abilities that we felt like we knew exactly what this project needed in terms of its video, creative, mm-hmm. execution, everything. We had proven ourselves to the parent company with, with the prior. They said, we want that, but for, our, but for this property, mm-hmm. basically said. <clears throat> like, all right, well, you know, different city, different audience. Different audience let, let's, let, but, but we know what we're doing, and because we don't ever like doing the same thing twice, we treated it as its own thing. Mm-hmm. And we had this thing, I'm pretty sure. Well, we had a got, formula. 
uh, yeah, we had a formula, but but we knew that we knew that that we just had so much confidence that what we had, what we pitched, into what we storyboarded, into what we scripted, into what we shot listed, was absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. And it was the first shoot we did where like we could see the edit. Well, because we even heads. you even created d digital storyboards for it too, and and I believe very detailed post-it based shot list and mm -hmm. schedule and everything. I think that was one of our first social posts even was kind of an over top of me, like putting all of the shots on different colored post-it notes. This is the project that I flew back from Alabama. Yes. I was on vacation, flew back from Alabama. We show up with the actors, the crew, everybody. And they said, and not they, today. They said, Oh yeah, we didn't want to do it today. Or they had fire alarm, uh, testing yeah. happening that day. Or, and they uh, didn't tell any. Yeah. Yeah. Um, separate problem. Yeah, yeah. So, like, even forget that that happened. We did the shoot. We left the shoot feeling like we got every shot exactly the way we wanted it. We got the performance exactly the way we wanted it. I started editing the thing. First cut came together like that. I hit the space bar. You were standing over my shoulder. We watched it. 60 seconds go by, and we both just said, it doesn't work. We both just sat there confused for a long time. It just, like, it doesn't work. How does work. this not work? And it was exactly what we had laid out. It was exactly what we had pictured. And you see the thing, and it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And that was such a humbling feeling. Yeah. Um, and then there's, you know, 10 minutes of panic. Like, well, fuck, what do we do now? We didn't mm -hmm. get any additional coverage because <clears throat> we just shot exactly mm -hmm. what we knew we were going to shot. Shoot. So there's one lesson. Always get enough coverage. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I don't even remember where we went from there. I believe we ended up like restructuring the edit. I don't know that we did any reshoots for it. I think we found a way to, to tweak the, the narrative mm -hmm. so that it worked better. And I don't even remember what was wrong with it. I just remember that feeling of, well, shit. Yeah. That's exactly what it was supposed to be. And that doesn't work. Yeah, and and I think and and I imagine <clears throat> if I really thought about it, that's probably happened a dozen times since. But I almost expect it now, mm -hmm. right? Like no matter when, how confident you are, you've put that first pass together, and you're like, "Well, shit." Yeah, yeah. Um, or, or I mean, and we we've had projects, you know, in the last year where you put the, put the first pass together, and it's six and a half minutes long. Sure. And you're like, all right, well, how do we get this done to two minutes? Huh. And, 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 and I think there was something similar with the, the 360 project that we did for, for another yeah, property probably. where we shot that. And I had forgotten about this, but I'm talking to Anthony about it yesterday. Uh, Anthony, why don't you come over here and get on camera? No? Okay. Um, uh, but I totally forgot that we shot the thing. Uh, with a a three hundred and sixty um, professional, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we shot the thing with all of these stationary shots, mm -hmm. and we let and we let kind of our characters like move, move around through yeah. within it, and and it was our first project with three hundred and sixty. Um, it was this. It was the client's first foray into three hundred and sixty. It was right for for the application because they wanted to be able to give people virtual an tours yeah. yep. and an experience that wasn't just like looking at photos or a video on the internet from home. It was giving them a f freshman experience. Yes. Cause we went to the Dean dome. Yes. Shot there, shot on Franklin street. Yeah. And what happened was we, we put the edit together and the stationary shots didn't work. Mm -hmm. And so we had to reshoot mm -hmm. and we invented helmet cam which I believe this is the moment that in the video version we put up the picture of me so happily wearing helmet 360 cam and uh, a light as a necklace, mm -hmm. I believe, is how we had that set up. The only reason it wasn't me is because I'm a tall. giant. <laughs> yeah, you're too tall. It had and, to be... And then the camera's up higher, yeah. so then all of a sudden our character is down. <laughs> so we went to like a used sporting goods store, found this baseball helmet, put this quarter 20 thing through it and then I got to walk around UNC's campus wearing this thing 
with with a 360 camera mounted to the top of it and an LED light <laughs> <laughs> draped like I was wearing it like a necklace so that we could throw light on the subject. So because I'm, you know, 5'9", at least, you know, the camera, I guess, ends up around six feet. 5'9". Five five the nurse told me she'd take 5'9". She said, <laughs> I'll give you 5'9". Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, imagine, imagine also being 38 at the time and walking around a college campus with this thing on following what looks like a You're college just freshman a girl, girl. <laughs> around the door. <laughs> so... Um, you know, so that was one that, that was more, th those were two kind of production related, you get to the edit, you think, you think it all works and then you look at it and it doesn't. And, and you either have to, depending on the client, the budget, the project, you know, you either have to figure out how to make it right yourself. I don't believe we charged them for mm -hmm. the reshoot, but we did it ourselves. We didn't bring the 360 expert back out. Mm -hmm. We went back to him and said, "Look, what can we rent <clears throat> mm -hmm. and do this ourselves?" I think what like learning is that was something that we learned from that as well is that even if it doesn't work, you can find ways to make it work. Yes, because we, we the other one we didn't reshoot. We right. just reorganized some stuff. Maybe maybe did a new VO or something. But um, I have two two additional things uh, about that. Well, let, let, let me just because because I think the. And we talked about it in the strategy episode is, you know, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and those things were so well planned. Mm -hmm. And, you know, regardless of how well, like you have to plan shoots to a T like that. But even if you do, it may not work. Mm -hmm. And so, you, I, I mean, it's, it's more argument to have more planning done so that at least you can salvage something mm -hmm. out of it. Or if you got to go go ahead and reshoot whatever. I mean, it happens all the time in Hollywood, and they've got the budgets. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time with huge national campaigns because they've got the budgets. But working where, where we work and, and where most of, our, most of our audience works, the margins are so thin. You just usually don't have the opportunity to be able to go back to the client and ask for more mm -hmm. on it. And so you have to be flexible enough to figure out, you know, you have to plan, but then you have to be ready to pivot if something goes yeah. wrong. Um, what, what were your two things? Never pay an actor up front oh. before they work. Because <laughs> I wouldn't have ended up paying that guy. Yeah. And... <laughs> Make sure you get your wardrobe back before everybody leaves. Especially if it's your own personal wardrobe yeah. that you provide for an actor. Because he showed up looking like a crayon. Yes, he did. Red pants, red shirt. Yeah. Because as it turns out, not a professional actor. Mm -hmm. um, took payment up front. Demanded. Demanded, sorry, yeah. Demanded payment up front. On set, mm -hmm. and if you'll recall, wouldn't sign the release unless promised additional work, which is easy to lie about. Sure, right? He's but, also kind of a creep with our main actor. Yes, kind of touchy. Yes. So we've never used Craigslist again. <laughs> I think we found him on Craigslist, didn't we? Like, these are our early days. Yes. L small budgets. Yeah. 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 Do not. Do not use Craigslist. Do not <laughs> use Craigslist to cast. I totally forgot that was a Craigslist. Mm hmm But but he's got representation now. Oh really? That's the crazy thing. I've seen him in other commercials. Thanks to us. Yeah. Um. So. Mm. Wherever yeah. you are. I so badly want to say his name and bleep it, but yeah. I'm afraid that, <laughs> I'm afraid that, that like, no, it's going to not get bleeped. Um, yeah, if you're listening, give Justin his clothes back. Oh, and yeah. Money. Man, that was, that was a good one. Um, so is it on you now, or was that yours? Uh, I mean, that all kind of... Is it a good time to bring in the sponsor, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, here we'll go to break quick. Tuxi. How long have you been letting your cat just sit around the house, scowling at you, eating your cheese, and basically suckling at the teat of generosity and love? And how long are you going to let your good-for-nothing dog keep barking at squirrels as opposed to earning your keep? Exactly how long do you plan to serve your pets? 
And exactly when are you going to decide to be their master? Toxie can help. Toxie is the newest pet to Butler P2B subscription service. Say goodbye to the days of self-driving cars, robot valets, and talking refrigerators, and say hello to Tuxie. How is this possible, you ask? What kind of weird science enables animals to gain the intelligence necessary to become effective butlers? These are, in fact, questions. If you use special code storyboard, you'll get a free fitted tuxedo for your dog, cat, or other mammal under 65 pounds when you purchase a six-month subscription. Discount applied at checkout. Tuxie, use your pet, not useless pet. Mm. Can you so, also get them for babies up to 65 pounds? That's a big baby. <laughs> Small humans up to <laughs> 65 pounds? It says mammal. Okay. Um, and so Check. you... You actually... You decided to try this out, but uh, you didn't get a mammal, though, did you? No. You got the, a penguin. Yeah. And how's that... He kind of looks tucked up, so that's... Yeah, well, well I, that, that that's what was... It's kind of like the... Um, the uncanny valley thing mm-hmm. where like you know robots look too much like humans kind mm-hmm. of when you put a penguin in a tuxedo it it's just a little off putting mm-hmm. um, because it's hard to tell where the tuxedo ends and and the penguin begins yeah it's also not recommended to um, get a penguin in late spring early summer in Durham North Carolina mm-hmm. um, i don't know if you know this but penguins like cooler climates um durham in the spring and summer is not Mm -hmm. so um frank's dead yeah but i could bury him in the tux from tuxie and so he looked fantastic i didn't realize he died so quickly yeah yeah it it did not i didn't feed him that may have been part of it well he should have been able to figure it out himself right yeah training never brought me an old-fashioned at night yeah but yeah he died pretty fast well, welcome to another sponsor, Tuxi. So I've got one, and this is one that, that we, we actually worked with an agency that we worked with a lot before. Um, even before this project, we had worked with them very successfully on. And in this particular instance, and I don't even remember the reasoning, the agency decided to, to bring us in. We developed the concept, right? They kind of gave us the brief. We developed the concept. Mm-hmm. Um, we... We basically budgeted the shoot, and then they brought in an outside director. Um, kind of surprisingly, like they didn't yeah. really give us. A there whole was lot of- there was something last minute ish about it, mm-hmm. and something um, that that kind of made sense. Um, but but he's also like a, a documentary filmmaker, yeah. and this was not a documentary film, so. Yeah. Ultimately, the problem was that that they had hired us to, again, not just be the production company, but be the video agency. And so we had, again, come up with a concept and, and, and prepped for all of that and were ready to direct. And then they brought in this other director, which, which at first he started working within what we had pitched. Mm-hmm. And then he started coming up with his own ideas. And then it got to the edit. And that's mm-hmm. where things got really was, crazy. Yeah. Because... Um, you know, I, as I recall, part of the "Hey, we want to bring in this director" was, but he's only here for the shoot. You guys are still editing the thing, mm-hmm. it's, and yeah. then yeah. we had one of our good editor, you know, freelance editors working on it. We're working with him. We get a first cut together, and all of a sudden, we send it to the agency, and the director's back, mm-hmm. and he's wanting to do completely different things. Just with the edit. takes the project files. And, and edits something himself, own, and it was crap. Completely different. It was, it, yeah. and it just was not good. It was just objectively bad. Yeah, I the <laughs> mixing black and white, and then color shots is just a really weird it, choice. And, and <laughs> that's and, something I wouldn't do. And again. as I recall, we we had planned for that, but <clears throat> but it started black and white. Yeah, and it went to color. When you introduce the product, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. and or or the black and white stuff was like the making of the product, and then how it gets used and whatever went to color or something was, like that. Yeah. Like there was a thematic, there was a motivation. It can be done well, 
And then the cut that we get back from him just has black and white and color stuff. Just kind of randomly. Yeah. Randomly, completely unmotivated. And, um, yeah, I, and I think that comes down to too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, if you're going to be hired as a production company, then the director needs to be there during pre-production mm -hmm. to tell you what to prepare to do. But if you prepare to do your own shoot and then and then the client or the agency or whoever you're working with brings in this director last minute, you got to say, well, because well, then we had to go hire a different DP, right? Yeah. We brought a whole different DP in yeah. for it and grip and everything. It was just, a, it changed it all the 11th hour. Yeah. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm not saying anything <clears throat> about working with agencies on this. A client could do this to you. Sure. Right. I, I mean, it, it, it just happened to be, and again, we had worked, you know, us entirely on several projects with that agency before. Mm -hmm. um, and they're a great agents. They do yeah, really good work. Yeah. And, and we've worked with them since. But, but I mean, that, that was something where I think they learned a lot. Yeah. Right. And I think we learned like that that could happen. Mm -hmm. I don't think we even thought that would happen um, yeah. because the relationship we had with them was that we just, anything that was video related, they could just put on us and we were going to do. But, Again, like the like the the re those real estate projects, like you've just got to figure out how to how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we ended up um, submitting our cut. I don't remember if there were competing cuts that ended up going to the agency, but we said, "Look, this is what this should be, mm -hmm. and this is what we're delivering to you." If you want to use this other version, I don't yeah. remember what ended up getting used, yeah, or, but I remember that being a part of it. Yeah, and that's you know, and that's that's an option because they changed the terms mm -hmm. of the project on us. And so we were still able to deliver what they had asked us to, del to deliver when we signed the contract. And we were able to strongly say, this is what we believe is the best so is this, video for So is this, this podcast mistakes they made? <laughs> um, this is mistakes that were made. <laughs> mistakes have been made. Uh, mistakes have been made. And people learned things from it. <laughs> How I'm, similar have our lists been? Not. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, but I think you probably have both of these ones on your okay. list. <laughs> I'm crossing off the ones that I've, um, funerals, weddings, personal projects. Okay. I, um, I thought about the funeral and I, I think I have two that apply to personal projects mm -hmm. or, or close two that I can spin off, but go ahead. Well, just looking back, um, uh, I hired you, or you're doing me a favor, I don't remember, but hired you to, to shoot our wedding. You paid me. Okay. Or, or the, Jen's the dad, dad paid me. <laughs> and uh, you hated it. I'd never done a wedding. You'd never done I one. I had no desire to do weddings. Yeah. And then when when I was editing it, because that was the idea, was like that I would edit yep. it. I'm like, I hate this shit. <laughs> yeah. I, I like, I mean, editing's fun. I just did not want to do a wedding. Yeah. Especially when there was no real concept for the video. It was just, here's what happened. Yeah. Um, no, I remember the photographer uh, during the reception sometime, the photographer coming out to like that big deck uh, to smoke a cigarette or something. She was like, so, do you like it? You going to do more weddings? I was like, this is the last wedding I'm ever shooting. <laughs> now, now, it's also important for people to know that we didn't know each other well enough for you to have invited me to your wedding. I don't think at that point. Maybe not, yeah. I don't recall feeling like, oh, I've got to work the wedding, shouldn't I just be going? Yeah. Like, I, I didn't I didn't know enough yeah. people there that I, I really expected to be invited. We had done, I think we had a year of work under our belt. Maybe. Like a, 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 a spring. Or that first. The first that, training yeah. program, yeah. Yeah. So, so it's not like I had, a, had an expectation of having been a guest at the wedding. Mm -hmm. uh, we barely knew each other, but, um, and it was a beautiful, <clears throat> I mean, it was, in retrospect, it was fun to have been there and how our relationship has evolved. Mm -hmm. it, I'm glad that I was able to be there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just, I haven't shot a wedding since. And, and I mean, and I think about too, like, wedding films were just blowing up at that yes. point. But I also wasn't working with a DSLR at that point. I was still working with like a Handycam. Yeah. So I couldn't get any of that like cinematic. low light, cinematic, soft. Mm -hmm. So Everything like, was in I, focus. I went into it like, you know, oh yeah, wedding films are beautiful. Like I can, I can make something out of this, and and I just, I just did not have mm -hmm. the resources I needed to. And then, yeah, I, I think it, it was interesting that that your plan was then for you to edit it, and it just, it just kept going and mm -hmm. going and it's going still not and done. Going. Yeah, I hear about that every now and then. Yeah, that's okay. 
You'll have a 10th anniversary at some point, right? <laughs> Funerals. Yeah. We did a, it was more like a memorial. Memorial service, yeah. But didn't we do two? Or we scouted we did, another? We did, did we? We did do two. I think we sent Stephen to do the second yeah, one. Yeah, that's we? right, yeah. that's right. And yeah, we did the memorial service in Chapel Hill at the retirement community. Yeah. Remember that? <laughs> the, Remember the old lady? <laughs> She was awesome. She was the best. Part I don't of remember day. his name, but she was like, you know, she was like, Maurice hated me. I would always talk to him when he was trying to eat dinner. And I don't like people very much, but I always wanted to talk to him. <laughs> oh, God. She nobody not, knew who she was. She was not invited to the service. Nope. She just, and she said that. Yep. Uh, but yeah, they're just not, they're, they are far too emotional of a project yeah for me to care and be want to be involved like well it, it it breaks down the so i have something similar even though we did get paid for it um we did work for a friend of a mutual friend of ours mm-hmm. and it's even though he paid us it's it was really hard to maintain the the client vendor, I mean, I don't like to say client vendor, but like it's really hard to maintain that professional relationship when you're friends mm-hmm. with a client too. And so, I, I mean, I've got I've got friends who ask me, keep asking me to do something for them and their family, and I just have to keep telling them I don't, I don't mm-hmm. work with friends. It's a rule. It's just too. I think the same thing with family. Some people, it's just too hard to do really well, and like that, just that's beautiful thing for yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, I mean, you see, I don't know. There's all like Hollywood kind of has their own cliques, you know, like Seth Rogen and Judd Apatow kind of yeah. thing, or like whatever Mark Wahlberg does. And but I imagine a lot of those start as professional relationships, right? And yeah. they become great Mate, friends. Yeah. yeah. Right. And you can become friends with clients, mm-hmm. but when the friendship is there first, it's just a totally different dynamic. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and and I and I, you know, I have a checkered experience working for family also, um, yeah. and and that really affected our relationship, um, and and I had to to say at some point, look, we can either be family or we can work together, mm-hmm. and I think we would both choose family, mm-hmm. so you know, we had to stop working together. Um, but you know, it took like a year for me to get to that point where where I could say that, and so I, I just, it's I, I don't even think we really discuss it. It rarely comes like into this office mm-hmm. because I think either time any of us are approached that we're just like not even a not even a thing. Yeah, personal projects that, that more what I meant is like a personal friend or a yeah. Like I think it's great if Anthony wants to make a, a, like a short film. Oh yeah, yeah, or yeah. whatever. Like all those personal yeah. projects, that's great. I, I encourage that. Um, but yeah. It's the uh, that those friendy. It's like where's the line kind of thing on this. Yeah, it's it's just again you're running a business, so you have to make business decisions, and it's just really yeah. hard to make business decisions when it's you know when it's rent. Yeah, if you want to do a personal project and and you know take something on, that's fine. But but I even avoid those. Um, just because, you know, this is what I do for work Mm -hmm. and I'm going to keep it work and I know how to manage clients and I don't want to manage my friends the way I manage my clients. Mm -hmm. Not that I treat them poorly, more poorly than I treat my friends. I just treat them differently. Mm -hmm. I think this, so that kind of reminds me also of, of barter work. Yeah. Right. Like, and you find this a lot with smaller companies, um, I have a service that, that you need, right? Um, uh, graphic design services or a website or uh, hosting or, you know, like I do something that you need to help you run your business. You do something that I need. So why don't I give you this if you give me that? Mm-hmm. And on the surface, it seems like it makes sense because you don't have to pay out of pocket to, um, uh, to get that new whatever website, yeah. whatever it is. Um, but in my experience, neither side in a barter relationship puts their best work into the project. Um, or, and, yeah, it, it's, and it's, it's more often than not that people are trying to make sure that they come out ahead. Right. And as and opposed I, to like, well, we didn't get paid for this, so we're not going to. Right. And so it, it's part of it is like the kind of, you know, doing business with friends part, 
But part of it also goes back to like the like the, there's no end, there's no deadline to it also. Mm-hmm. Like it's real easy to prioritize, you know, oh, well this has a deadline, so let's work on this project today instead of this project that has no deadline. But oh, well this is a paying project and this isn't a paying project. Mm-hmm. Um, because, and let's be honest, you know, having a 50% or 30% or 25% final payment once you finish the project, it's a great motivator to get the project done quicker. Mm-hmm. And, and in a barter situation, that's usually not there to motivate. So, um, yeah, all of those kind of yeah. lump into one. Those are, those are minefields that you should approach with caution, mm-hmm. I think. And to that end, what we've learned is we just stay away from them. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you want to go? I'll go. Um, over niching, over positioning. That was my last one. Okay. Um, we and I think we've done this a couple times to be honest. Um, before we did. Um. So we went in in late 2018, early 2019. We decided to laser focus and put ourselves out there as video strategies for growth stage companies. Mm-hmm. We were working with a consultant. Yep. Yep. To kind of help we us. Were, there was a lot of really smart work that that led us to that. We had just come off our best year ever. Yep. Where we we had done exactly what we set out to do. Yep. And we, we, we changed the dynamic from being a production company to a video agency mm-hmm. where we were owning decisions for our clients yep. and making strategic uh, decisions and um, kind of building out those roadmaps. I mean, it's, it's the foundation for what we are today. Yep. And we a- had balls bigger than that door frame and couldn't even get through there. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the way we went yeah. into 2019. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um. Yes, we had high aspirations for 2019. I'm glad 2020 has turned out so well. Um, <laughs> we're all going to die. Um, yeah, I uh, don't know where I was going to go next. You were kind of saying... We, Balls yeah, we, through me. You had... Um, oh, yeah. So so there was... there was So through this, this class, um, we were encouraged to push deeper and deeper and narrower and narrower narrower Mm -hmm. and so we felt so much validation and so confident that we could put ourselves out there as video strategies for growth stage companies but what we didn't realize until probably august was that people saw video strategies and thought oh i don't need strategies i need videos Mm -hmm. and for us we thought oh this is the tip of the spear this is how you know, we get people to come to us and they're going to say, okay, I see you do video strategies, but do you also just make the videos? And we say, oh, yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. But we so narrowly focused. And to, to be fair, we believe that a, a strong positioning and a, a, a very niche yes. uh, um, field occupy is, is a very important part of business. Yes. It's not that we don't think positioning and niche is, is important. Right. And, and, and we had, I mean, we had drunk the Kool Aid and we had. We had followed for years the principles and finally paid to enroll in the program and had a great, you know, a great run through the program. And so I had no, I had no doubt. I felt like we were finally doing yep. what we'd been reading about for years. Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately what happened, I mean, it's kind of the same thing as, as well, yeah, it is the same thing because we made a big SEO change also mm-hmm. for our site. And very quickly, we learned that we were number one in in Durham, Raleigh, and North Carolina for video strategies. Mm -hmm. But nobody was searching for video strategies. Yeah. And so what's the point of being number one? Well, we were trying to skate to where the puck was going to be. Yeah. And we just, it's still, still, we're still waiting for the the puck. The the puck has not been passed yet. Right. Um, And so, and so it, it was... It took a while of no incoming business to realize um, that we had just overskated the puck. Like site traffic went down and yes. everything. Yes. I mean- and, 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 and it took us a while to admit that it was because we had just gone too narrow. Um, it's like we were out in the woods marching and just like 
we, we thought everyone was behind us. We turn around, we're like, Shit. hello, <laughs> where, where am I? <laughs> and if an army marches in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, then does it really mix metaphors? <laughs> um, uh, and so, uh, and so we've we've had to we've spent the last now year about trying to undo all of that damage that was done by over over specifying over niching over specializing mm-hmm. is probably mm-hmm. what I'm looking for. But what but what I think we've realized is that when you when you think about and this company that that we worked with for this training, they help creative agencies. And so when you look in the world of creative agencies, video is already specific enough Mm -hmm. of a niche. And then even just the little addition of B2B is that cuts out over half. Yeah. So, um, so there are, you know, the, you don't want to put yourself out there as a full service agency because then you're, you know, um, a jack of all trades, master of none, kind mm-hmm. of thing, right? So there are web agencies. You can't SEO be an expert agencies. in twenty things. You right. can be an expert in one thing. Yes, and so there are web agencies, SEO agencies, um, design, design, uh, graphic apps. Um, yeah, right. All those speci- and and now we're at a point where video is just another one of those specializations, mm-hmm. and our expertise is in video, and that's enough. Mm-hmm. Our expertise is in all of video, figuring out what you need, why you need it, how to make it, making yeah. it, delivering it, getting it out there, right? Like we, we specialize in all of that, but being a specialist in video and only video is enough of a tip of a spear mm-hmm. um, that at least people who are looking for whatever they're looking for in that process know that we do that. Mm-hmm. And so they can come to us and say, hey, I need you to make this. And we can say, that's fine. And I have all the confidence in the world that we can turn them into long-term clients and go about their projects the way we go about all of our projects and be true to, to the company and the video agency that we want to be, um, but at least have people understanding what it is that we do mm-hmm. and not thinking that we occupy this such a narrow space mm-hmm. that there's really no opportunity for it right now. And then in two or three years, when people are looking for B2B video that has a strategic component and this holistic approach, because mm-hmm. they're doing enough video that they need to have a video agency. Well, more that experience many more than, years of experience. Yeah. So yeah, that, that was a big one for me that was just, you know, not problem related or project related. That was just a mistake that we've made and we've certainly learned a lot from it. Mm-hmm. And we're still here, thankfully. <laughs> Um, what, uh, what other ones you got on there? I got, um, I got a couple that may be worth discussing. This to me is more of the, like, what would you do differently if you started your company now? When we first started and it was the two of us, our plan was that you would go generate a deal. We would work together in pre-production and production. I would take over post-production and then you would find us the next deal while I was editing. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, I, I think it's it's a bigger problem that is is almost um, across agent the agency world, regardless of what kind of agency you are. If you're small, you're you're focused on getting some work. Then you have to put all your resources into doing that work. Mm-hmm. And then only once you're done with that work can you then put any resources into going and finding your head more up. Work. And you're like, but there's nothing there. Yeah. And so I think we had it partly right. At least we weren't going to completely devote all of our resources to finishing a project and then start to sell. Mm-hmm. At least we were going to break off after the shoot. And then while I edited it, you would go find the next thing. So we were like a third of the way there. But you really need to be, and, and one of our early mentors told me, you really need to spend you know, two of your seven days a week marketing yourself. Spend five days working on projects and spend two of your days working on marketing and selling yourself. Um, at the least, and that means you have to do it every week and every day of the week. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so I think that was something that that is more of an answer to what would I do differently if we were starting this company today, is um, is just figure out how to keep you know keep that you know feast and famine yeah. uh, cycle from happening that just so many agencies fall into. 
Uh, you just have to find consistent time. It doesn't have to be a full day, but you've got to find consistent time to be putting nets out there. And, and, and thankfully, as we've grown as a company, we've, we've been able to utilize more resources to, to, to do that, mm-hmm. right? To have, to have lead generation working for us for inbound stuff. Right, and not having to do everything outbound or, or outsourcing the outbound. And, and it's hard to do that when you're a new company, but you've just got to commit to consistent time to, to selling because, you know, burying your head in a project and then coming up and trying to find the next one isn't a long-term solution. Mm-hmm. And? Don't make a company culture video when... Um, when, when you ask the company what's your company culture, they say, oh, we don't know. We're hoping this video will tell us once you're done with it. Yeah. Um, That's probably I don't know that buried it, in some other... Yeah, <laughs> I don't know that it, it, it raises to the level of, of these other ones, but it was one. As I went through our historic list of, of clients, um, that one certainly jumped out as a red flag. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we ended up making a pretty good video, and I think it did reflect the culture that was there. Yeah, but it would have been nice to have had a little bit more of a a guiding force behind it. Yeah, to understand what we were trying to capture, right? I mean, your job as a, especially in a company culture thing, your job as a video agency is to amplify the message that the client wants to put out there. So if they can tell you, oh, we're this, that, and that, then you can go after the things that make them look like this, that. that. Yeah. If they say we don't know, we're hoping to find out when we see your video. You just kind of capture everything and. Ultimately, in the edit, you have to say, well, this is what we're going to make this company's culture. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not good for anybody. No. Um, Especially people that are getting hired. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, that looks cool. Oh, that looks fun. I want to work there. That is nothing like I thought Crickets it would be. Crickets when you get in there. Yeah. That office was so quiet. Yeah. Oh, I remember when their HVAC went on. Kind of those terrifying. like balloon HVAC things. That, that was would terrifying. But it was inflate so, so and quiet. deflate. And what a beautiful location, I too. I know. God, I would love to have that as an office. But it's there uh, now. I don't know. I'm not driving know. all the way. No. I um, like this little shithole. I like this little shithole. Yeah, it's our little shithole. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think that's, I mean, I got a couple more on here, but I don't think they're really worth discussing. Okay. So. Fantastic. Yeah. Just so saying. We don't discuss them, just saying. Um. A local restaurant we oversold. Uh, we gave them stuff that they didn't need, and so they didn't need it, so they didn't know what they wanted. And with they it, didn't use it? And they didn't, and they didn't use it. <laughs> we also worked with a local foundation that canceled multiple contracts, and we didn't enforce our termination clause. And I think that was a mistake we made. We tried. Who was that? Ah. Uh, how was that a mistake? Well, I, I mean, again, what, what I have here is, is we didn't enforce our termination clause. Ah. Right? I mean, we had, because I remember we had one, because, well, I think, a, no, I think a, a mistake we made was we made our project manager bring Dude. it up because we were too afraid to. Yeah. Um, so I think as, as business owners, we um, shirked our, respons- our personal yeah. responsibility on that. Um, but, you know, I think that was that was something that we really should have we should have pushed harder and gotten something for that because because that was multiple contracts that just went completely unpaid mm-hmm. um and 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 affected our relationship with mm-hmm. them as a client i mean we left they're in, they're in a fantastic and yeah and and you know they're in a really interesting place now yeah and I know. i'd love to have them as a client but i don't know that that'll happen because of you know what happened when they were our client yeah but I, you know, I think that's another thing too. Is you have to be, you have to be willing to move on from the bad clients, and they're not necessarily bad clients. But when bad things happen to projects, you have to be prepared to just sever that relationship, and you know, some wounds heal with time, mm-hmm. and as long as you keep some kind of relationship there, um, maybe not a sales relationship, but nurture some kind of relationship, then. Maybe it's two or three years, but you know maybe they come back, and mm-hmm. if they don't, it's fine because you move on. And and you know I think like we talked about a little bit at the beginning, you you know you develop your contract based on how you get burned in the mm-hmm. past. 
Um, and so you have to, I mean, ultimately the takeaway here is whether it's your mistake or a mistake a client made or, or an agency or, or whatever, you know, what can you take away from it after the emotion passes? Mm-hmm. What can you take away that helps you run your business better? And some of that is in, you know, preparing yourself for uh, creative failures. Some of it is in, in, you know, account relationship failures. Some of it is um, production. Production. I mean, there's all kinds of, of, of ways that, that things can go south. There are a lot of ways to fuck this up. There's a lot of ways <laughs> to fuck this up. And you're going to fuck things up. Yeah. As a client, as a vendor, as an agency, uh, as a freelancer, you're going to fuck things up. But um, That's how you become an expert, though, is you, you fuck things up enough where you realize don't do 90% of those things. Here's what. Yeah. Here's how to do this. Yeah. You can't be an expert and not have made mistakes. Right. And and you have to have the ability to to pick dust yourself off and move on. Yeah. Because some of these things can be real. I mean, we've had some that were really tough. I mean, re- like almost existential crises, at least for this, you know, the business's mm-hmm. existence. We've had some close calls due to some of the mistakes that have been made. And it's it's hard to think rationally when you're being that emotional, but you know, spend the time, do your own podcast episode and review these things to, to, to see how far you have come. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I said, in the first 10 minutes, this is much more soul searching an episode than I thought it would be. I thought we'd just be like, here is like, Infinite. you know, here's some fuck ups that we had and mm-hmm. here's how you can avoid them. But I mean, it's really become an assessment of how we've gotten to, to where we are. Um, and, and we've gotten here probably more by the fuck ups than the wins mm-hmm. to be perfectly honest. Um, but we're here in spite of our wins. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so I wish we had a pet butler. Mm-hmm. Do you have any kind of solution for that? that yeah, we, we need, hear first about? we need a pet and then we need Tuxie. Okay. Tell me about Tuxie. How long have you been letting your cat just sit around the house, scowling at you, eating your cheese and basically suckling at the teat of generosity and love? And how long are you going to let your do- good for nothing dog keep barking at squirrels as opposed to earning her keep? Exactly how long do you plan to serve your pets? And exactly when are you going to decide to be their master? Tuxie can help. Tuxie is the newest pet to butler P2B subscription service. Say goodbye to the days of self-driving cars, robot valets, and talking refrigerators, and say hello to Tuxie. How is this possible, you ask? What kind of weird science enables animals to gain intelligence necessary to become effective butlers? These are, in fact, questions. If you use a special code storyboard, you'll get a free fitted tuxedo for your dog, cat, or other mammal under 65 pounds when you purchase a six-month subscription. Just kind of apply to checkout. Tuxie, use your pet, not useless pet. The penguin's not a mammal, is it? It's not. That was the it, problem. That, it cost a lot of money to get that tux. That was the problem. Well, I used the storyboard code, so I actually got but a substantial you, but, discount. But you didn't have a, it wasn't for a mammal. No, it wasn't. It was. Was it fitted for a dog or something? It was. Uh, you know what? It just. Are you sure it was a penguin? I don't know. <laughs> I'm all. I'm all weirded out now. <laughs> it did like cat food, though. I mean, I, I used to bring it into the office. You guys saw the penguin, right? <laughs> right. This is. A- It's not just a Billy Madison thing. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Um, So thank you for listening to us uh, open up some of our old wounds, throw erasers across the uh, room. Never play with matches. Oh. Um, (laughs) This is a video reformation podcast. This was episode 32, mistakes we've made or other people have made or fuck-ups and things we should have learned from them. Uh, Well shorten that for SEO purposes Um, uh, like subscribe all that stuff we've been getting a whole lot of new um, downloads recently yeah if you're a new listener keep that coming thank you Um, welcome Welcome. all the new listeners um, or the you know data glitch that is causing us to have 3x monthly downloads over what we've been used to but uh, keep it up we like it Um, keeps us going we will uh, see you or you will hear us uh, on the next episode of the video reformation. That's an expensive camera and an expensive lens that I don't think you should be throwing pencils at. Yeah. 
What have you learned from that mistake? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's us. Fantastic. Thank you. See you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. What are you still doing here? It's over. Go home. Bye-bye. Is that um, originally... That was... David Spade, right? Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. And then, of course, I was doing the Heavenly Ferris War. What's that? The post-credits. Where he comes out of the bathroom and he's like, What are you still... Are you still here? What are you doing? The movie's over. Oh, oh. There's no enough for theater. And then Deadpool did it as a riff. What do you think this place? I wonder where the, uh, the first... Where